All right, great. Um, so my name is Rick Heidens. I work for JW Player. Um, first, I'm going to uh, explain a little bit about our uh, data science ecosystem. So we have a lot of different services. Um, basically, our backend is entirely built on a service-oriented architecture. All these different services store data in their own data stores. Um, for example, a lot of services use PostgreSQL as a database. Um, we use extensively use Amazon S3 as uh, data storage, uh, object storage. Um, then within our data science ecosystem, then we do some processing on that data. So, um, for example, we run jobs on EMR that read some data of S3, usually in a parquet format, and then um, uh, transform the data, write it uh, back to S3 again. Um, we do some things with Kafka, um, mostly real-time pipelines. Um, we also do some change data capture with Kafka, so we monitor databases for row-level changes, stream all the changes to Kafka, and then uh, we have consumers within the company that then um, uh, read those changes and then perform some operation based on the data that they read. Um, we make extensive use of Snowflake. Snowflake is our data warehouse. It's where all the different data sets come together and where um, we as a data science team um, can join all the different data sources together. Um, so for example, we have data coming in from Salesforce. We have data coming out of Kafka. We have data coming out, out of Postgres databases. Data coming from S3. Um, when it's in Snowflake, that's where uh, everything is queryable and joinable and everything else. Um, there's also Kubernetes in this slide. Kubernetes is very important. It's what our entire backend runs on. Um, all our services, APIs, etc., run on Kubernetes, but we also do a lot of data processing on Kubernetes, and that's specifically um, what I'm going to talk about next. Um, there, there's also some scikit-learn and TensorFlow. That's, those are usually the libraries that we uh, use to um, do anything related to machine learning. Um, so, um, as you can see, we have like all these different things, but how do we get data from one place to the other, and how do we orchestrate all of that? So that's, that's essentially what, uh, what, what we're going to solve. Um, before we jump into that solution, uh, first a little bit about JW Player. Um, so we're an open source video player and platform, um, similar to, let's say, a YouTube, but then um, for publishers. Um, we're headquartered in New York City. Um, we have about uh, 200 employees, um, but also a little um, office here in Eindhoven with a couple of uh, engineers. Um, we're mostly a SaaS business, so um, our customers are um, pretty well known and um, are, are pretty famous publishers, such as in the Netherlands, NOS, New.nl, but also worldwide we have a lot of customers. Eurosport is pretty famous. Uh, Univision, I believe, in Latin America. Um, we do about 14, 40 billion plays every month through our player, um, which is about 5% of all the online video plays. And um, every single month, we ingest about 100 terabytes of analytics events, um, mostly coming from the player. So um, our player sends all sorts of events um, when, um, when something happens. So for example, if someone plays a video, we get an event of that. If someone um, watches a video for a certain uh, amount of time, we get an event of that. And that accumulates to about uh, 100, 100 terabyte of data every month. Um, so the main difference between us and, let's say, a YouTube is that we're a white label solution. Um, we offer a lot of the same services, but we are always a little bit in the background, um, which is probably also why you might not know us. Um, but yeah, the player is present everywhere. Um, so um, one of the reasons why you might choose us over, let's say, YouTube is that we, for example, don't take half your um, advertising um, monetization income. Um, so uh, the rest of this talk, um, I'm going to quickly reintroduce Apache Airflow. Um, then I'll talk about some of its shortcomings and some of the things that we have run into. Um, then our deployment system, which is built on top of Kubernetes, um, uh, which is important in order to explain how we um, actually run the workloads using Airflow. And then we'll have a short retrospective. Um, so Airflow. Um, who of you have went to the, let's maybe do a show of hands. Who of you went to the workshop yesterday from Axel? Okay, so good. Um, I see that quite a few people have, have been there. Um, so Airflow is a platform to um, order, schedule, and monitor workflows. 
So the idea is that you define your workflows in Python code. Let's see. Uh, better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the idea is that <coughs> when you <d> <coughs> when you define your workflows in Python code, that they put, become collaborative. You can version them. Uh, you store them and get you deploy them somewhere, and they're easily reviewable. Um, so Airflow is built on top of a couple of course concepts. Um, the most important concept being the directed acyclic graph, the DAG. Um, so the DAG is essentially the collection of all the different tests that you would want to run. Um, so for example, here um, we have a DAG with three nodes in them, which are the tasks. Um, a can only run, uh, or B can only run after A, but C can run at any time. Um, then the operators are um, the tasks, uh, the abstract task definitions in your DAG. So um, here I uh, outlined B, which is one task in your, um, in your workflow. Um, then once you have these DAGs and these tasks, um, they, um, your DAG, for example, also has some properties associated with it. For example, when it's set, when it's supposed to be run, so your uh, DAG can run on maybe every, uh, every day at 10 p.m. or maybe every, every hour. Um, so when that runs, um, the, the operators in the DAG will be instantiated, and that's what, what we call a task. So at that time, we, you can parameterize certain things. For example, maybe you want to run some task, and you want to pass it an argument, for example, the execution date for this task. That's wh what happens when you uh, instantiate the operator, and that, at that point, you have a task instance. Um, the task instance uh, represents that specific run of the task at a certain point in time. Um, so by combining DAGs and operators um, to create task instances, you can build really complex workflows. Um, so Airflow itself is, um, consists out of a couple of components. So um, there's the web server, um, the scheduler, and the workers. The web server is the UI that you can navigate to. Um, everyone who has been to the workshop has probably seen that UI by now. Um, the scheduler is what uh, looks at all the different tasks that need to be run and tries to figure out which ones need to be run. And then the workers are what actually do the, do the work, so where your tasks execute. And then um, Airflow uses a database to keep track of all the state about um, which tasks uh, have been run what the, and what, their, uh, st what the state of that was. So at JW Player, um, we run all these different components except for the, data, except for the database and Kubernetes. So the web server runs on Kubernetes, the scheduler, and the workers. And we use Amazon RDS for the database because that, that is easier than running a database in Kubernetes. Um, so at JW Player, um, we use Airflow for a lot of different use cases. Um, so we launch EMR clusters running PySpark in order to process all the telemetry that we receive from the player. Um, we run queries on our Snowflake Cloud Data Warehouse um, to join data from all different data sources in order to build reports. And we run a lot of those reports on a daily basis to inform our, for example, our sales organization or just in other internal reporting. Um, we have some um, m uh, products that are powered by machine learning models, for example, Recommender um, and or uh, thumbnail uh, selector. Um, we can use Airflow to um, train and evaluate and then deploy those models um, to production. And um, yeah, we do a lot of different standard ETL um, workloads um, are being orchest orchestrated using Airflow as well. Um, so for us, Airflow enables our data science team to um, operate autonomously. Um, within our team, even data scientists can work create their own workflows, and they can do their own data processing. This is really nice because um, you, we are not always dependent on um, another team in our company for data. We can just create the workflow ourselves, deploy it to Airflow, and get it up and running. Um, and the nice benefit of Airflow is also the added transparency. So um, because we do all these things within the data science team, we can um, just go to the UI, see what the state is, um, and based on that, we can figure out, like, okay, should data have been present or not? And um, do we need to take any action? So, for example, um, right now, um, we're working on a new uh, product where we um, replace um, a static uh, thumbnail for videos with a video thumbnail. 
So um, in order to support an A-B test, in order to figure out how much that moves the needle in terms of click-through rates for video, our product manager wants to uh, perform an A-B test. So in order to do that, um, we need to uh, change um, the job that essentially um, analyzes the telemetry from the player. Uh, the player needs to start, start sending that to us, obviously. But then we need to make some changes to, in order to support that A-B test. Um, then um, we basically have a table in our data warehouse that has metadata about thumbnails. Um, we have to make some changes to that in order to figure out whether this is a video thumbnail or not. And then um, we uh, make changes to um, partition and aggregate data for users in the different variants of the A-B test, um, such that we can do that analysis. And then based on that, anal anal based on that data, um, we have to calculate reports in order to figure out what the result of the A-B test is. So all, all of these different tasks um, need to be orchestrated in some way, and that's where we really use Airflow for. So what, what might a workflow look like? So uh, more concrete, um, here I have an example. So we have a DAG that runs on a, on a daily basis, and this DAG's goal is to um, aggregate video plays for the analytics API. So one way that, that you can do this is you can launch an EMR cluster to analyze all the tel telemetry that you get from the player in order to count the number of plays per video. Um, this, this might be the first step in your DAG. The next, uh, then after that, we can uh, add another step that loads the aggregates into our data warehouse, after which it is queryable. And then we need some on, on a final task that then pushes those results from the data warehouse to the analytics APIs such that they can be served. Um, so then at that point, you have a DAG, three, three separate tasks in there. So um, one problem with this is that, um, so one, one thing that I must make clear is that a lot of these ship with Airflow, and they, um, uh, they basically perform some, your tests to some extent. So this EMR create job flow operator is a thing that ships with Airflow and then makes a call to Amazon in order to launch an EMR cluster. So um, to some sense, Airflow is concerned with um, what your task is. Um, this is a problem for us because it's the wrong level of abstraction. Um, because these operators are responsible for some piece of your task execution, um, the, task, uh, the task is really tied to the operator. Um, the problem with that is that if, for example, there's a bug in, your op in, the, in the Airflow operator, and in your, or in your task, and you need to debug this, that you not only need to debug your own task, but you also need to figure out whether maybe that operator is doing the right thing. And that, that, is, that is really hard. Um, that it, it just is a, it has a really negative impact on the debuggability of your workflows. And we don't really want that. Um, we want to separate task orchestration from task execution at which, or, uh, at which Airflow is not, not ideal, but we really like it for its um, task orchestration capabilities. Um, so what we did is um, we already extensively used Docker for building services. Um, we are using Airflow for workflow orchestration, and we were already using Kubernetes to um, uh, run our backend applications. So we figured that it would be a good idea to sort of tear that apart, um, separate the concerns, um, where Air, making Airflow responsible for all the task orchestration, but then doing all the compute in Kubernetes itself. So um, at JW Player, every task is a Docker container. Um, so the idea behind that is that containers improve application portability, make it easier to release um, uh, um, new versions of a task, uh, provide some guarant consistency guarantees, like your environment is always going to be the same, whether you run your uh, container locally or whether you run it on, uh, on, 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 yeah, on Kubernetes. Um, so this is really nice because at that point when your task is defined in a container, it can be treated as a black box by Airflow. Airflow only needs to run it at some point, it needs to figure out when it can be run, it then runs it, and it then has to wait for um, the task's um, results, so it can either fail or succeed. Um, this is a really powerful concept. So um, this is an example of one of the DAGs that we uh, run internally in the data science team. 
So here we um, have some tasks that create an EMR cluster, and um, then once that, that, that job is done and it, is, it has loaded data into the data warehouse, we have a bunch of other tasks that then um, do something with that data that was loaded. Um, so all of these um, purple tasks, we are running all of those in Docker. And we make a few exceptions, and those are the really lightweight tasks that are like one or two lines of Python code are um, typically sensors, because um, it's a lot of overhead to run a sensor in Kubernetes. Um, so Airflow actually has a solution that allows you to run your tasks as Docker uh, containers. Um, but the, the way that it works is that it just communicates with the Docker daemon, which is nice, but that doesn't really work when you run your Airflow stack itself on Kubernetes because you don't get direct access to uh, the Docker daemon. Um, so we did actually use this for a while when we were not running Airflow in Kubernetes, but yeah, at some point we migrated that over and we had to find a different solution. So then Airflow also comes with uh, a thing called Kubernetes pod operator. So this is an operator um, that allows you to run pods on Kubernetes from Airflow. Um, it's a really nice solution, uh, but that also requires direct access to the Kubernetes API. And unfortunately, even though we run everything on Kubernetes, we don't get that at JW Player. Our DevOps team is really uh, yeah, sort of protective about who gets access to what. Um, so we needed something different. And in order to understand that solution, I have to explain what our deployment system looks like. So I could probably feel like a 30 minute talk about this, but um, basically the general idea is that um, we have Kubernetes and then we run some services on top of Kubernetes to manage deployments. Um, in particular, uh, two services are important for us and those are Gantry and Squealer. Um, essentially Gantry is the tool that uh, interacts with Kubernetes that we get to interact with and Squealer is the event bus of the deployment system. So whenever something happens in our deployment system, we can lis listen to those events by listening to that event bus. Um, so Gantry uh, manages our deployable resources. So um, it's a really thin abstraction on top of the Kubernetes API. So we can create deployments, ingresses, uh, jobs through it, and cron jobs. And something that's also really nice for machine learning is because um, it's just a thin abstraction on Kubernetes, we can also use all these nice features such as uh, running jobs on GPUs, and um, yeah, Gantry makes it easy to uh, to create such a job. Um, within our deployment system, uh, Squealer is the event bus. So anytime something happens um, on Kubernetes, um, a message will be published to to this Rabbit MQ event bus that that is uh, um, managed by Squealer, and then um, everyone can sort of connect to that event bus and listen for events. So. For example, when you create a job on Kubernetes through Gantry, a message will be pushed to that event bus and then consumers can listen to that. So you can perform some action based on whether um, some event is going on on your, on your cluster. So um, yeah, what we did is we took this deployment system and we built an operator that's analogous to Kubernetes pod operator that um, launches tasks as jobs on this deployment system. So um, the way it works is that um, in Airflow, um, we have the operator that talks to Gantry that creates a job. So this entire deployment system is all based off on APIs. Um, Gantry then goes and creates a job on Kubernetes. Um, we then start listening in our operator to um, lifecycle events for that job. And um, once something happens, um, we act on that. So for example, if the job uh, starts running, then our operator knows that the job is running and it starts logging some output on Airflow's logging logger, logger um, so it's such that you can track the state. Um, one thing that's a bit tricky is that since your job now runs on, on a cluster, which is uh, not on your local Airflow instance like you would usually do, logging works a little bit different, differently. Um, so we actually need to be able to get logs from our job into Airflow because we would really like to be able to go to the web UI and still be able to see uh, the job's output, um, which is really useful if you're debugging. Um, 
so typically our locks are just being extended into a standard Elastic Surge Lock Stash Kibana stack. Um, but for um, this operator, we actually interact with a Kubernetes uh, API method, read namespace podlock, which is actually the only exception that we had from our DevOps team to directly interact with a Kubernetes cluster because it was a bit uh, of a hassle to get those logs into Airflow from our Elk stack. Um, so basically what Gantry job operator does is that it has this concept of a log tailor once it creates your job and it has detected that it's running it will instantiate a log tailor and that will basically um, start streaming the logs from the Kubernetes API back onto Airflow's logger and then at that point you see the logs in the, in the web UI again. Um, in order to um, support this operator, we had to make a number of changes to our jobs. Um, basically, uh, when, we, when you run your jobs on Kubernetes, you need to be able to fetch your configuration from somewhere. So um, the configuration for all our jobs is stored on S3. Um, we had to change that such that jobs can pull con their configs from S3 um, when you start them or you need to be able to read uh, config from your environment variables. Um, we had, so Ulysses is the secret um, a system of our deployment system. Basically what it does is that it uses Kubernetes secrets to mount a YAML file containing all the secrets that you need in your, um, in your job pod. So we had to change all our, our, all our jobs to be able to uh, to read secrets from that format. Um, and then um, lastly, what's really important is that um, on Kubernetes, um, exactly once execution is not guaranteed. Um, this means that if you create a job on Kubernetes that transforms some data, um, then it is not guaranteed that that will run only once because um, when it runs on the cluster, a node could go down the Kubernetes um, controller will then detect that and will then see that, hey, this node is gone, we need to rerun the job somehow. So we had to make sure that when we move to this model that all our jobs are idempotent. Um, this is really important when you don't do this. Um, for example, when you have some job that inserts data into a table and it doesn't check whether that data is already present or it doesn't always overwrite the same partition of that table then you'll end up with double rows in your table and your job is not item potent. So we had to put in a lot of effort in, in making sure that this was handled uh, correctly everywhere. Um, but in retrospect, um, Airflow um, enables our engineers and data scientists to write complex workflows in a self-service manner. So data scientists can uh, write workflows, engineers can do it. Um, there's yeah, the review process is really lightweight. Um, it's really easy to get something up and running. Um, within the data science team, we can now use this operator to um, leverage all the features that you would typically get from Kubernetes. So we can use Airflow to uh, run complicated pipelines that train machine learning models, evaluate them, and deploy them somewhere. Um, within the organization, this system has been adopted by multiple teams. So. It started out as a project in the data science team, but um, yeah, now our core data team, who is responsible for all the pipelines that power our products, has also adopted this model. So internally, everyone is on the same stack now. And um, yeah, it, it just has been really successful for us. Um, yeah, that was uh, my uh, engineering talk about Airflow. Any questions about the setup or um, 